That's great. We are talking about, where are we there, Armani, our superstar? We're talking about rhythms, making space for God in our daily lives. And it's been a great series. We actually, uh, we've so, so enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm so grateful for the team that's been putting that together. Laura preached a cracker last week. Uh, Simon's preached. The, the incredible gift that we have in Sam Cogger is going to bring it home next week. Why don't you give him a round of applause? That's going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, and we're going to move out of, out of this space, which is a very practical um, area where we've been looking at how we're doing spiritual formation within the context of work and rest. And then we're moving towards Easter, which is, believe it or not, only five or six weeks away. And we're looking forward to constructing maybe not so much practical preaching, but maybe some establishment of some theology around who Jesus is. And we're going to look at the seven I am's of Jesus. That's going to be super cool. Theology is really just a simple word of our faith, seeking deeper understanding. And so we want to put that in around the person that we've just sung about. Here's my heart. Well, who are you surrendering your heart to? That'll make a good question, right? If you can't answer who am I surrendering my heart to, well, I suggest you keep turning up because we talk about Jesus and we try to unpack him all the time. So that's kind of a little bit where we're going in the future. Uh, we've also got um, Pastor Paul Bartlett coming in a couple of weeks' time. And if you don't know Pastor Paul, he is the, the quintessential cut me and I bleed Mondays. All he wants to do is see our faith move into our communities in just some brilliant ways. And I'm so excited about him coming to preach. Are you? Good. I hope that you've got an opportunity to take some notes. I don't mind if you're on your phone taking notes. That's where I do all my notes. But if, if you look over someone's shoulder and they're on Facebook or they're playing Candy Crush, just give them a bit of five-fold ministry and say, listen up, God wants to speak to you this morning. All right. So uh, where, are we going? where have we been? Amani, we have been, we've done the problem with our work and rest. We've done what is true rest. We're going, what is Sabbath and how do we do it? How's, how are people going with just applying components of Sabbath into their world? You, you're having some fun with that? Excellent. Uh, we've gone, what is my role on the planet? Laura did the blessings of work last week. That was just so, so cool. And today we're going to talk about making room. You can go back and look at all of those on YouTube. And I'm pretty sure that all of the people who have shared in that space would gladly give you their notes. So all you've got to do is go and ask them uh, for their email, and they'll email it for, to you. If you come and ask me for their email, I'm not going to give it to you. But then again, I wouldn't give your email out to somebody else either. So, so that's a fair transaction, isn't it? But if you want to see Simon's notes or Laura's notes or my notes, just come and ask. We would love to be able to, um, to share that with you. But today we want to talk about making room. Now, in, in the sense of, in terms of making room, uh, we've been making room, well, actually, I'll tell a lie. That was, that, was the, that was a very ambitious use of we've been. Karen has been making room at home over the Christmas holidays. She's been actually doing a big tidy out. We've got, we've actually lost, not lost the son. Noah's moved to WA and we've got a, um, and we've got a new uh, piano coming in. So a shuffle, we've been shuffling rooms and there's been boxes and tubs and, and, and Karen and all of her wisdoms decided to clean out one of our sheds and bring all the tubs inside with all of our memory stuff. And it's honestly, it's looked like we've been moving for the last six weeks. All right? But we've been making room for stuff and we've been going back through all of these treasures um, that we had forgotten we even had, like kids' um, assignments or letters or engagement cards, wedding cards. Karen found a letter that my mum had written to me on my 80th birthday. That's kind of special, right? I got a letter, Mr. and Mrs. Arnold, I got a letter from Daniel Fithian, who is now uh, a pastor down in Kingston. So he was part of our original youth ministry, Contagious Youth. Try and call your youth ministry that these days. Uh, Contagious Youth. And, and he wrote me this letter. He said, Dear Pastor Matt, you are the greatest youth pastor on earth. Congratulations on your new baby Jonah, telling you how old it was. And you are the mastermind behind our youth ministry. It's kind of nice digging those things out, right? So I actually had to say to Sam, hey, Sam, I've been telling you you're the greatest, but the older I get, the better I was, so you're going to come second. But we get to dig these treasures up and we get to, to celebrate them and go, oh, they'll remember that. And, we, and we're looking at, at things from our past. And, and then there are also a whole bunch of stuff we honestly don't need anymore. There's stuff in there which has just been taking up space that we can't actually access the precious because we actually haven't been dealing with the accumulation. Are you with me? So we, I've got actually, if anyone wants some soccer boots, I've literally got a bag in the back of my car with a collection of about 15 years worth of football boots. 
all right? Um, some of them are in decent nick, but um, we're just going, why have we been keeping these things? So we, we're trying to make a little bit of room. Are you with me? We want to make some room. The world, is, the world has never been more cramped. Your lives have never been more crowded. Hello? We have seen, and I know it feels like a long time uh, for some of us, for, for most of you guys, you wouldn't, even have a, you wouldn't even have a remembrance of before internet, all right? But we honestly, during, the, during that sort of that 90s and, and early 2000s, got to see the world literally shrink before our eyes when the World Wide Web came online. Because all of a sudden, we, there, was, there was a global culture that was like literally right there in front of us, that we're not reading newspapers or watching the 6.30 news. The world just shrank right before our eyes. We understood there was global culture of Coca-Cola and Nike and, and Ronaldo and Messi. You know, I remember standing in, um, in uh, being in Africa, in, up in uh, Addis Ababa and out in Bahadar, right out in the middle of Africa, and there were kids out there wearing Manchester United soccer tops. It's crazy. I remember hearing a pastor in Nepal say he had gone and done his pastor's training and he went to plant a church. Uh, he, it was a two-day bus ride. It was a three-day mountain hike up into this remote, remote village in, the, in uh, Nepal. And he gets there and they're selling Coca-Cola. Yeah. You know, the Coca-Cola got there before the gospel did. The world around a global culture, the world around our ability to communicate, the world around the ability to travel just shrank. But as it shrank, it just got tighter and tighter and tighter. Well, all this information, all these options, all this, this stuff that we could have, I could get it online, I can get it for free shipping and it'll, and it'll turn up three days later. And the world shrank down on us. So, but how do we make room in that space? We can't access some of the precious stuff. We can't access some of the, the beautiful things, the powerful things, the tools that we need because all we've done is just accumulated all this gear. And so when it comes to working or when it comes to resting, we feel really boxed and hemmed in. It's like being packed into a car with, where you're going to go camping and everything is just, you almost pack the, you pack the kids in first and you pack everything in around them. And they're sort of locked in with tents and sleeping bags and, and toys and stuff. And they're, and they're just locked in there. And they can't, couldn't get out even if they wanted to. You're all with me. Yeah. I love the, the thought of, of Mute Math in their, in their song, Clipping. It, it says this, and I think this sense of, of confusion in our world, this, this restriction in our world. They sing this, I don't know who to fight anymore. I don't know what's right anymore. I don't know how to feel anymore. I don't know what's real anymore. Because we're trying to create spaces where we can be authentic with our relationship with Jesus. And we're trying to create spaces where we can be active in that faith and be restored in our resting. I don't know who to fight, what's right, what's real. We have this, how do I know what right thinking is? How do I know what right doing is? How do I know what right feeling is? We have these, these questions of our, of our morality and our meaning. We don't know where we come from. We don't know where we're going. Our origins and our destiny is all confused. And then what's right, what's wrong? Who, who helps me shape this? And we've got this confusion going on. I read this, I read this quote, and it's probably going to upset somebody, but good. I live to enjoy life by the little things, feeling the grass between my toes, breathing fresh air, watching the wind sway the trees, enjoying the company of loved ones, a deep conversation, getting lost in a good book, going for a walk in nature. Now, I don't have a problem. No, <laughs> I don't have a problem with you enjoying the grass between your toes or a warm summer's breeze sitting on the beach. But if that's what you live for, can I maybe contend there's actually something more? So I wrote down Mary Gold Wellington, who actually wrote the quote. I went, really? That's what you're living for? We're not living for ourselves, beloved. My Bible tells me that as a believer, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. My faith informs me that this salvation that I have in him is not actually about making sure I come first or I get my needs met, 
but that I actually sacrifice and die daily, picking up my cross and following him in order that his object may flow through me. The church, or the word apostolic in one of its renderings actually means to be sent. The church by nature is an apostolic organization because it is sent to the world because God is on mission. The church exists because God has a mission. Not so that we can actually have a happy clappy club, but so that we could gather together where one is weak, the other can be strong, where we can correct and address and admonish and celebrate and resource in order that we can actually fulfill our purpose on planet Earth. And that is not dipping your toes in a warm pool of water and making that your highest goal. I told, might, I told you I might upset some people. But we want something to live for. We want something to die for, fight for, live for, surrender for. We need to make room so that it doesn't all just come crowding in. If we are going to work and if we are going to rest, if we're going to know Jesus in all of those expressions, we need to make some more room. And I want to talk to you today about making that room. Is that okay? You've already seen it up on the slide behind me. We're positioned for purpose. And we want to know Jesus, the master of time management and mind leadership. And I know that word mind leadership almost sounds like a, like a Netflix show, but we'll get there, okay? I want to, I'm going to draw some distinctions today between management and leadership, time and your mind, okay? And the importance of identity and all of that. What's the next one there, please, Amani? These are some of the things I'm really hoping you'll pick up out of today. Saying your best yes in this space, creating some margin, spaces for silence and solitude, hitting the pause in a world that never stops. And then there's some practical how-tos. I'm not going to preach through those points, but I would assume that there are some people in the room today that as we're talking about rhythms, rest and work, as we're talking about being positioned in terms of purpose, some of those questions are going to come up. And I believe that if that is your question, I don't know how to say my best yes. I just say a billion of them and I'm tired. I don't know how to create margin. I just feel the world is continually creeping in and I, and I go to bed working and I wake up working and, the, and the, the cycle never stops. Today I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you about that. Silence and solitude, hitting pause, practical how-tos. So let's, let's move into this. Are you all doing okay? Yeah. I want to look at the difference initially between management and leadership. If we're positioned for purpose, we get to manage and we get some lead some stuff. I want to talk to, uh, to you today about time and your mind and so we are going to manage our time and lead our minds because management by definition exerts control over an existing resource your time yes it is actually about mastering a, a, a materials or a, a group of people to achieve an end but it is with an existing set of resources money a building or time in terms of physical hours, management. We are going to learn to manage our time. And I would like to hope that Jesus is actually going to give us some pretty cool tools because he is the master of it. Leadership is actually more about creating something new and utilizing others to also help achieve that goal through collaboration. So we're actually wanting to lead our mind. We wanted to actually, how do we do this formation in a, in a community sense? Who is it that can actually help me get rid of this stinking thinking? Who is it that can actually help check my thoughts when they want to come and simply steal in and determine what I can or I can't do when the person I should be determining what I can do or shouldn't do is actually Jesus Christ himself. And I want to be able to lead my mind in those areas. There is a difference there between managing your mind and trying to lead your time. Good luck trying to necessarily create more time. A lot of our young people, you would understand that there is that there is a you you won't have more necessary disposable time than you've had when you actually step into other elements of your life. But we all have 168, 168, 162 hours a week, 52 weeks of the year. You don't get more. There is not a dispensation when you become a parent or a pastor or you leave school. You don't suddenly get more time. You don't suddenly get 
less time. You actually get to use your time and learning to use your time, manage that time, apply yourself to that time. So a resource as see that time is actually really important. You're all good. Yeah. And then we're going to create something new with mind. So let's move on. Let's talk about this sense of uh, finding our purpose. We're positioned for purpose through our identity. And I'd love to challenge you today. Can you write that down? If someone was to ask you, what's your purpose? Can you actually write it down? Can you make it plain? Uh, I may not, it may be your global purpose. This is why I'm here on earth. Maybe it's actually your purpose in a current place of work or school or ministry. And we can break those sort of things down. But are you in a position to be able to encapsulate that and write with clarity and power, this is what I'm in this church for this is why I'm singing on stage this is why I'm going to work tomorrow it is not just to earn a living but what is the greater purpose and I'd love to wrestle with you and ask you can you make it plain and write it down is it a 3,000 word essay or could you actually put it onto the back of an envelope because if we can't understand our purpose, then we've got to make more room because I guarantee you there is a whole bunch of stuff stealing in there which actually isn't related to your purpose. It's been picked up by people's expectations and comparison and just literally being undisciplined in our thinking and our living because we've only got a short period of time and it's actually not about you. It's really good that we've got great preachers like Simon and Laura and Gary and Sam to be able to get up and help unpack all this. So I can just get up here and be mean with you. But your purpose is not to fit in. It's not to sit down, shut up and be served. You're the head you are not the tail. And we have this in identity. Let's look at Luke 4 where Jesus actually understands his identity wholeheartedly. In, in Matthew 3, we have, the, we have the story of Jesus being baptized. And as he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes and rests upon him and says, a voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. I'm well pleased with him. Listen to him. Jesus' identity is established. Okay? Not just through a baptismal moment, but is affirmed to humanity and to all eternity in that moment. He had been cultivating that for a long time. And then he, it says he goes out into the desert where he's tested and he's tempted and he comes back. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And this is where he starts articulating his purpose statement. It was written down for him by Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before. It's written down for us. I'm going to challenge you to actually be able to take this statement and articulate it in your own lives. But he came back preaching in his synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. That's a tough gig, saying these things in your own backyard. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up and read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And this is from his identity, and this is his purpose statement to which he continued throughout all of his life to make sure there was enough room for that these would be his prerogatives. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to do these things, to proclaim good news to the poor, proclaim freedom from the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's why he's going, this is why I'm here. I wasn't baptized and the Holy Spirit didn't come down and you didn't all hear my father saying, this is who you are and I love you for no other reason other than to achieve this purpose. And he wants to say the same thing about you. We've got a job to do. We're here to work. We're here with purpose. We say this all the time. You are made on purpose for purpose to live in relationship with him, to shine his love, to become love, to do good things, that those around us would see those good works and give glory to God because of them. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you've got to turn into a preacher. It doesn't mean you've got to go and, and um, prophesy over everybody in your workplace. But I don't care if you're a nurse or a landscaper or a parent or a policeman. I don't care if you're a student or, or you're unemployed. Your job 
is to know Jesus and allow Jesus to be known by, by no, allow yourself to be known by Him. Hello, and as I preached a couple of weeks before, is to cleanse lepers, heal the sick, raise the dead. Sorry, Marigold, not to feel the grass between your toes. Now, there is an essential nature of being able to stop and rest. Absolutely. Can you achieve these things from rest? Yep. Can you achieve these things through rest? Yes. A large part of this message was formed yesterday in not doing anything about this message. By resting. By taking Sabbath. By doing things with my family. But it's not the goal of rest. The goal of rest is that we would actually see his kingdom come. Awesome. Sharing with a friend the other day, where I've just been on Friday morning, and it was, you know, there's a lot of pastors and leaders and churches out there who actually don't want Jesus' kingdom to come because they're too busy enjoying their own. Too busy enjoying what I'm creating, what I'm leading. It's my kingdom. That's not what Jesus said. He said, my kingdom come. My will be done. We need to get out of the way. We need to understand that it is we live for him, not the other way around. So Jesus has got this purpose statement. Let's, let's flick on really quickly. And Habakkuk 2 you can just thank your lucky stars that Habakkuk's parents aren't still around us naming. How'd you like to be named Habakkuk? That's a brutal name, I reckon. Habakkuk. But Habakkuk is, is actually, he's standing in a day where Judah, the, the, the country of Judah, the kingdom of Judah in which he is prophesying to, is making deals with all of the nations all around him. And they're actually losing their, their, their Christian, their, their spiritual identity with Yahweh. And they're taking up... Um, diplomatic avenues and financial avenues and military avenues trying to strengthen their kingdom and they're taking their eyes off God in terms of him being their king and this is what he's prophesying into and he's saying I'll, I'll stand at the watch and station myself on the ramparts I want to, what do you want to say to me about this God because this is actually not the way that people live in relationship with their God this is not what it means to try and construct and manipulate and control and determine the success of our people, we do that with a living relationship with God. Could I contest that some of the issues that we face in our life is because we haven't invited a living relationship with God into that space? Areas of temptation, areas of disappointment, areas of shame, areas of weakness. Oh no, I'll determine that. I'll, I'll deal with that. Habakkuk and Judah are dealing with the same issue right here. And he's going, listen, I want to, I want to, what are you going to say to me? I've got this complaint about my people. I've got my complaint about how they're living their lives independent from you, God. I see the sickness and the weariness and the weakness in my people as they continue to turn their back upon you. What do you want to say about this? And the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that when the herald, so that a herald may run with it. He goes on to prophesy about Judah. He goes on to prophesy about what's going to happen and some of it's good and some of it's bad. He's actually talking about Babylon coming and, and taking God's people away. But what the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that we get to stand before the Lord and go, what do you want to say to me about my marriage? What do you want to say to me about the way I'm living in community within, in my place of work? And can you make it plain? Can you hear from God or are you going to hear from your worry? Can you hear from the Lord or are you going to hear from your limitation? Can you hear from the Lord about your future or are you going to be determined by your past? And can you write it down? Could you share it with somebody so that they can go, I'm going to join you with that. I'll take that vision and I'll run with that with you really hard to do that with a 3,000 word assignment. The revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks to the end. It won't be proven false. Do you linger? Wait for it. It will come. It won't delay. Find your purpose. Write it down. Make it plain. You all good? Even on. We need to lead 
your thinking. Where the mind goes, the person follows. You know what? If you think you're a useless, no good, scumbag, loser, dumb, fat, ugly, no good, you are going to act like that. Because where your thinking goes, the person follows. If you know you're a prized possession of King Jesus, that he loves you, he's with you, his spirit lives inside of you, he created you to be a vessel that he longs to come and live in. And we cultivate this sense and my mind continues to, to ruminate and meditate and enjoy about the fact that the King of glory loves me, wants to live in me, knows that I'm nothing but dust, knows how far short of his glory I fell and yet... And yet, he comes to me every morning, new in his mercies and new in his grace. Yeah. If I think about those things, do you think my, be my behavior changes? Do you think I live up to that? Or do you think I live down to it? I, um, I'm hoping I'm not going to steal this from him. Well, I'm going to steal this from him. A message from Francis Chan. He, say, he says this, just close your eyes for two secs. Close your eyes for two secs. Can you picture in your mind a cat? Picture a cat. You got that? Just nod your head if you're picturing a cat in your head. All right, nods all around. Can you picture that cat wearing a hat? Nodding your head. All right, got it. Can you picture a cat wearing a hat holding a balloon? Kind of got that one. All right, open your eyes. You just led your thinking. You can think about whatever you want to think about. If someone is suggesting to you that you're a good person, that person's got future, that person's got nobility, that person's got courage in them, and you choose to shape, you choose to shape your thinking, you can do it. I understand that there are a number of different uh, situations in our thinking we need professional help with and potentially medication with, but for a vast majority of us, it actually comes down to, I have been given the mind of Christ. How about we use it? How about we think like him? How about we set our thoughts on things above, not on things below? If we actually want a life which is resplendent in purpose, that does beautiful and magnificent works, that actually point to the, to the, the love and the nature of God, and then we can step back and just relax and breathe and just take some time out with him and then go again, not working for rest, but working from rest. Yeah? yeah? We need to lead our thinking. Again, please don't just let me say, oh, it's very glib for people who are going through clinical depression and other areas of, of, um, that require psychiatric help and, and attention. I'm not trying to do that. I am saying, though, for a vast majority of us, we live below what's really possible for us yeah. on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, situation-by-situation. Yeah. Jesus will never tell you that what you can't do. He'll tell you what you shouldn't do because it's beneath you, but he won't say you can't, this person's bad, that person's this, this situation's hopeless. He's only going to speak life. He's only going to speak love. He's going to show you where the next miracle happens. We often just think about, oh, the mess, the mess, the mess, the problem, the drama, the pain. And we simply slip off into a victim mentality, which the devil's really happy. He doesn't have to touch us anymore. We're doing our own work in that space. Jesus will tell us, he sees beauty, courage, identity, we can look at the mess and he goes, that's where my next miracle is coming from. Yeah. He can look at the pain and he says, that's actually where I want to reveal my promise. He can look at areas which we understand are fractured, broken, on fire, diseased. He goes, I determined that I'm going to bring something good out of that. And it's not just a Brian Lake throwaway, Brandon, sorry, Brandon Lake throwaway line. If it's not good, then it, God's not done. It's not a throwaway line, beloved. We pers persevere until we see God get the glory out of everything. We need to lead our thinking. So let's do that. Let's have a look at what, what did Jesus do when it comes to this. In Matthew 4, uh, sorry, Matthew 16, 
from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, you must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus has been having a fantastic time to this point, telling everybody about the plans of the kingdom and healing the sick and raising the dead and doing wonderful stuff. But from that time on, from the revelation, it was actually from Peter's revelation that Jesus is the Christ, from that time on, he said, okay, you just flick the switch. Now we're doing it in a different direction. The revelation has come. It will be spoken about all eternity that I am the son of God. That when I actually said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, it is founded in the revelation of my deity. From that time on, he, he, he changed the narrative and said, it's not going to be easy though. And this is what has to, has to happen. And here we find Jesus leading his thinking. Who wants to go and be betrayed? Who wants to go and be, and be um, treated like Jesus was at the cross? Jesus knew what was coming for him, not only at a physical level, but at a spiritual level. That the only person who would ever in all humanity have, in all of history, in all of eternity, have Father turn his back on him would be Jesus. So that Father would never turn his back on us. Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was Christ crying on the cross. Jesus knew what was coming. And it wasn't just nails and a thorn. It was isolation. It was being cut off from the Father because of sin. Not his, mine. Not his, yours. He knew what was coming. And at some point in time, Peter took him aside and said, Lord, this will never happen to you. We've got followers. We've got, we can raise finances. We can raise an army. No, Jesus, this can't happen to you. And there was an opportunity there for Jesus to go, you know what? I can, I'm, there's, a, there's a door out for me. I don't have to live up to my purpose. I don't have to live up to my identity. I don't have to walk into this call. There's an out here. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, please let me just take this, uh, let me just deflect this away from Jesus talking to Peter and then Jesus talking to you. Let's talk about how we take up the, Christ, the mind of Christ here when something comes in to delay or to deny your purpose and your identity, how you speak to it. I'm not trying to put you in Peter's point. I'm not trying to get you to go, oh, I've denied this. I'm not trying to get you to, I'm trying to get you to walk like Jesus walked, to do as he do, to think as he thought. Well, that was nearly tripped up on then. And say, that is not the way we think around here. That is not how we're going to live our lives. We are not going to be victims. We are not going to be selfish. We are not going to put ourselves first. We are not going to allow us as a family or as a church or as a staff or as a team or as a neighborhood or as a suburb or as a city or as a state be determined by our circumstances or our past. No, get behind me. Get behind me. You know my heart bleeds to see Tassie saved. I don't care if I see it. I am so happy. I was sharing with Karen yesterday. I am so happy if all I ever am is the person who dug out the foundations. Ben, Jonah, and other builders know it's dirty, muddy, really unsexy work. You never get to see it again, but the deeper that foundation, the more solid it is, the more beautiful the home, and the more, the more beautiful the building that will be above it. I don't care to be standing on the stage of the future church if I could actually have a shovel in my hand to dig its foundations. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need that. So when Satan starts to come and say, you won't see Tasmania, say, like, get, get behind me. That's not the way I think around here because it doesn't have to be because of my preaching, but if it can be because of my love, my grace, my leadership, that I get to surrender to you. If all you ever wanted was my life, God, here it is. Use it however you want and I will discipline my thinking. Yeah. I have pastors and leaders in this state go, you shouldn't preach that. Tasmania will be saved. Either they, A, they're worried about people being disappointed or maybe they all won't be. I don't care. Let's, let's, let, well, okay, if all of Tasmania is not going to be saved, let's start with 500,000. Let's have a cup of tea and, and leave the rest of the Lord somebody else can do a bat and run with it. I'm good. Yeah. But we've got to control our thinking. When it comes to your money, 
when it comes to your friendships, when it comes to, to guarding your sexual purity, control, lead your mind. You've been given the mind of Christ. Jesus himself was pushed and pushed back and set, and one of the, one of the I think it might be Luke somewhere says, and he set his face like flint to Jerusalem. That's where I've got to go. Because on the other side of that is Lance. And on the other side of that is Caden. On the other side of that is Jonah. On the other side of that decision is Matt. I'm going there and I will not let anything delay me. We all good? Managing your time or it will manage you. I've got this quote here that says, the good news is that time flies. I'm sorry, the bad news is that time flies, but the good news is you're its pilot. You've only got those set hours of time. Carl Sandberg said this, time is the most valuable coin in your life. You and you alone will determine how that coin will be spent. Be careful that you do not let other people spend it for you. I've said this many, many times. I don't really care if you waste petrol, my petrol, my, my, my food. Don't waste, I don't care if you waste my money. Just don't waste my time. You can, you can refill my fridge or restock my petrol tank. You can't replenish my time. I've got an issue with people wasting toothpaste. I don't know what it is. Just pray for me. For the, for the last 25 years of, of children brushing their teeth going, did you really need to use that much toothpaste? I don't know what it is. I, I'm, I'm opposed to wasting toothpaste. Pray for me. But don't, let's not waste time. It is the most precious commodity let's not waste it on fear let's not waste it on trying to control others let's not waste it on lingering in these fields of disappointment what did jesus do there's a couple here great work amani Jesus says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work, but while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. It's daytime. I'm conscious of what I can get done. If you don't think that anybody knew the pressures of time, the demands of time, it would have been Jesus. He had three years to get it done. Three years changed everything. So that's a fairly tight schedule. When actually the stuff that he packed into those three years... Is that Acts or the end of Luke tells us, and if everything else was recorded, there wouldn't be enough books on the planet to record everything that Jesus said and did and broke loose and blessed. Yeah, Matthew 22 is actually talking about this, these two great commandments and the great commissions. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and mind, and loving your neighbour as yourself. You need to manage your time if we're going to do those things. We're going to get practical in just a sec. Jesus said, authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, and you know it. Go into the world, teaching them everything I've taught you, baptizing them. There is, we need, if we're going to achieve this, we need to manage our time. Jesus was aware of that. So let's have a real quick look at some of the things Jesus did in, in order to achieve that. Then I'll give you some practical examples too. Jesus guarded his devotional life. Yep. Yeah. If we're going to manage our time, if we're going to lead our minds, we've got to guard and treasure a devotional life a devotional life basically says the time that you spend focusing on jesus alone you may do it by reading the bible you may do it by worshiping uh, i suggest you don't do it by reading a book or listening to a podcast they are components which will teach you and guide you but if you want a devotional life i would not say that i'm spending time with karen by reading a book in her presence I'm spending time with Karen by looking at her and listening to her and speaking with her and letting deep call out to deep call out to deep. I'm not opposed to reading. I read a lot. I'm not opposed to listening. I listen a lot. I'm not opposed to watching stuff. I watch a lot of stuff. I love it. But that's not my devotional life. My devotional life is where I situate myself in the presence of God and I try and guard that. Now, I love the fact that what you'll find, the people I stand up here do, we don't say, do as I do, we'll say, do as I try to do. Yeah. Like, we get it. We just do it going, we're, we're normal human beings. It's not always possible for when the alarm goes off to get up at that time. I get it. We discipline ourselves as best we can. We have the best intentions. Our motives are right there, but sometimes we don't get it right. 
And so we'll, we'll touch that in a second. Jesus was not driven by the expectations of others. Yeah. Stop comparing yourself with what somebody else says or does. Just be true to you and that will flow out of a devotional life. Jesus established priorities and then he shared them with other people. So you may go, I know what my purpose is, but have you shared it with somebody? I would suggest that if you really want to make something meaningful, then you actually bring some people into that space as uncomfortable as it is that may keep you accountable. That may go, hey, how are you going with that? Where are you going with that? One of the great um, blessings for your life is when we actually volunteer here or we actually set up our, our tithing into a house, it actually really does help us prioritize and we're sharing the load. If you're on a roster... It's, we kind of go, I wasn't thinking of going to church this morning, but I'm actually I'm serving on the coffee machine, or I'm actually doing this. If you've got a small group midweek, you kind of know you're committed to that. It's, it's, it makes it so much easier when you've made a decision and you've shared that with somebody else. Jesus was never idle, but he knew the importance of rest. He deliberately chose his companions. I love the concept when, when it says in Colossians 3 that they spoke to each other with psalms and hymns and uh, uh, encouraging and admonishing one another. I've picked this theme up over the lot more over the last six months. I think it's so important for the body of Christ to have people in your world that can go, don't be stupid. I need those people that can admonish you. They can go, that's not who you are. That's not the way we do things around here. That is not the kingdom coming. That's you establishing your own. You're better than that. You're bigger than that. You're stronger than that. Act like it. Think like it. Talk like it. Right. And being able to be admonished by people. Not just, I'm going to think my own thoughts and, and I'm, not, I'm going to be in this silo of myself. And we wonder why people hit walls. Fall off perches. Go dry. Because we actually haven't had somebody in our world that can admonish us. Jesus chose his companions. Again, please understand that we're not talking about admonishing Jesus here. Jesus always loved those in front of him. I love that. So let's get practical. Some of the things we said at the very beginning in this space is saying our best yes, why we need margin, space for silence and solitude. If you need to be picking up on some of those things, what are you saying yes to? What are you saying no to? They're important things. And again, I would suggest that you choose some companions. You bring some pastors or some leaders into that space. You take that into a devotional time with Jesus, not telling him what you want and asking him to agree with you. He won't do it. He loves you too much. We can shop our opinions around to find the people who will finally agree with us. and Oh, they're anointed. I want to do this and so I'm going to find someone. No, 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 no. Yes, do whatever you like. Oh, we're friends now. And, and I, don't mean to be, I don't mean to be cruel in that. I've done that. I've done that. So we look for someone who's going to give us the out that we want or the answer that we want. We need margin, space for solitude, hitting pause. So there's a couple of things that you're going to need there. And if you want to take some notes, I haven't got this up on the board. There's a couple of things. If you want to be able to lead your mind and manage your time, you're going to need these things, right? Really practical? You're going to need a calendar. You're going, to need to, you're going to need to put some stuff in a diary. You're going to need to prioritize it. You're going to need to block it out. I suggest you share it with some people. It doesn't mean that you're beholden to that every single hour of every single or every single week. But I love what, um, and I've really been encouraged by Simon. I've gone and put in Sabbath in my diary. I mean, after doing this all these flaming years, right? You'd think. You'd think. But we're all learning together, right? Now, it doesn't mean that I get to do every single Friday night to Saturday night, uh, and it doesn't mean I'm doing everything that I really want to do, but I'm on the journey. So get off my case, Satan. All right? You're going to need a diary. You're going to need to learn how to use your calendar. All right? So if someone says, I'm going to do this on a Tuesday night, you've got a small group, it's already in the calendar. Oh, sorry, I'll just check my diary. No, I've actually got something in there. It doesn't become optional. Yeah. Flopping Facebook characteristics of the day like yes no I'm interested I'm so glad Jesus didn't respond to my sin with I'm interested maybe if Jesus had responded to my requests and my needs and my brokenness and my and my gifts the way we respond on Facebook to things so get a diary write some stuff down put Sabbath in there put church in there if you're actually on if you're actually on roster 
Here's a thought. Put it in your diary. Serving on Kids Church. I have to be here at this time. Great. No, then all of a sudden we don't get that Saturday night. <gasps> I'm on Kids tomorrow. <laughs> We've all been there. If you're going to lead your mind and manage your time, you need a, a, a calendar, you need an alarm on your phone or a bedside table. Noah, our Noah is so disciplined in some of these areas, he knew that he wanted more uh, time away from the screen. So he would charge his phone out in the kitchen and he got a little digital alarm clock that was next to his bed. So he simply set the alarm on that so he didn't have his phone in his bedroom. He's 25 years old, he's got more discipline in his little finger than I've got in my whole body. It makes me sick. But... If you need, you need an alarm, if you want to get up out of bed to spend time with Jesus, you need an alarm. Now, there are people out there, and I just wish it was me, that goes, when I need to spend time with the Lord, the Holy Spirit will wake me up. I believe it. I do. I don't have a problem with that. It's just, it just hasn't been my experience. There was a period of time there where I was waking up at 3 o'clock. I wanted to do the fourth watch. I was getting up at three o'clock in the morning to pray, and I was actually, and I, and I was going, God, if this is, if this actually is you, then I'm actually going to ask you that you will wake me at three, and I'll get up out of bed and spend that time in prayer. And He was doing it, and then He stopped, and I was rather grateful. <laughs> just being real, just being real. You're going to need a calendar, you're going to need an alarm, you're going to need a friend. Okay, husbands and wives, when that alarm goes off, and they hit snooze, and they hit snooze again, they're going to need a friend. Okay, be a friend. Just, I'm just, I'm just throwing that one out there for freeze, right? I've got a very gracious friend in my bedroom who when I hit that alarm and I hit snooze, she's very gracious to me. You're going to need grace. If you're going to lead your mind and govern your time, you're going to need some grace with yourself because there's going to be some days, there's going to be some periods of time when you are just not going to get out of bed. I get it. There are some days, there are some times when you're going to get out of bed, you're going to go to spend time with the Lord and you're going to check the cricket score and that's going to lead to checking something else and it's going to lead to checking something else. And I don't know what I'm going to wear today. I'll just better check what the temperature is going to be and all of a sudden there's your devotional time gone. Does that sound like I'm speaking from experience? So you're going to need some grace for that. You're going to need a space to go to. Because if you needed that again, I'll, I'll say it one more time. You need a calendar, an alarm, you need a friend, you need some grace, and you need a space that you can go to that you can start cultivating that yourself. I understand for some of our young guys it's not as easy when it's not your home that you're living in, but the, you know there can actually be, even if it's you're going to create a, 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 a space on the floor with a pillow and a blanket and a book and a Bible, uh, you know something like that, you can create that in your own space. All right, so um, let me, let me I'm, I'm very aware of the time. I've got, I've got two more really quick points I want to make and then we're out of here. The first one is, can we, let's, if you want to do this thing, then ask for help. And by asking for help, I don't ask, mean asking for help from me. I mean saying asking for help for Jesus. I want to lead my mind. I want to manage my time because I, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here for a short period of time. I want to make sure that I'm, I'm flowing with Sabbath, with rest, with obedience, with a, with a freshness and a newness and a fragrance that comes from a pause. I want to do that. I want to work. I want to be purposeful. I want my space of teaching or, or, or of studying or of leading. I want that to be fruitful and, 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 and preach a presence of God wherever I go. Is it possible to be a grave digger and actually resemble the goodness of God, the peace and the joy of knowing his presence. Yes, it is. So I'm saying to you, if we need to go and ask him for help, let our motive be, learn from Jesus. Let, don't let worries about your time consume you. Just keep asking him for help. His spirit lives in you. His spirit's working in you. And if you want to spend time with Jesus, let me just ask you this question. Let's, let's play A or B. Let's, who is asking you to spend time with Jesus? Jesus or the devil? It's not the devil that's saying, you've got to spend time with Jesus. He wants some line time with you. He wants to establish your identity and your purpose again. It's Jesus who is working in you. 
So if you go, I just want to spend time with Jesus, I can't get it right, and I keep stuffing up, the motive, that, that whisper, that candle in your heart is him. I hear the voice of God. I've never heard the voice of God. All I want to do is spend time with God. You just heard the voice of God. He wants to spend, so ask him. And then we don't get it right. Admit it, quit it, forget it. I'm just preaching to myself now. Okay, that wasn't great. All right, that wasn't good. I need to adjust it. What did I learn? What could I do differently? I understand this has happened. I understand that has happened. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit that. I'm going to quit it. I'm going to say, no, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. Like Noah with his phone and a, and a, and a digital alarm. I'm going to quit that. I'm going to change that. And I'm going to forget my mistake. I'm going to forget what is behind. And I'm going to press on for the goal for which Christ has taken hold of me. Amen. All right, so let me ask you one more question as the team comes. We've been, we're friends, right? We're all friends. Yeah. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to make a decision? Be discipled, be disciplined. Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you willing to suffer? Because when my alarm clock goes off, and it goes off early, I don't, always want to be out of bed. I love it when Jesus says, and he was up before it got light. Not, most days I'm up before it gets light. But it hurts. It costs me something. I love bed. I'm a big sleeper. I can't go off four or five hours like some of you guys can. I, I need a certain amount of sleep, so I discipline myself to get into bed early enough so I can get up in the quiet of the day and set myself before I get to go and walk with the opportunities that I have, the gift that I have, into the pain that exists. I need this time with him, but it, it costs me something. To be a disciple requires discipline. Are you willing to sacrifice something? Or do we actually want all of Jesus and nothing of me? My, my friends out there, my older friends out there, would know that Keith Green sang a song, Asleep in the light. Do you see? Do you see all the people sinking down? Don't you care? Are you going to let them drown? How can you be so numb not to care if they come? You close your eyes and then you pretend the job's done. The world is sleeping in the dark that the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. How can you be so dead when you've been so well fed? Jesus rose from the grave and you can't even get out of bed. I love you, but let that sting for all of us. If we're going to do something great in the name of Jesus, it's going to cost us something great. Not sleeping in getting up out of bed and getting on with the mission of a world which is in flames. A world which is tearing itself apart. A world of growing ups but inside their five-year-olds. Harassed, helpless, terrified. And we carry light. We carry truth. It's in your prayers. It's in your worship. It's in a devotional life and a stillness with the Lord that empowers an authority into the world to proclaim good news to the poor, to set captives free. Blind eyes open. Bodies are healed. Marriages are restored. Keith Green finishes his song come away, come away, come away with me, my love. It's not just meant to be a condemnation of what the church isn't doing. It's been an invitation to more. Now my time, I've blown my time. But I felt the Holy Spirit's here and we're not, we're not worried about time as such as we are actually worried about truth hitting home. So now here's your opportunity to go, this is I want to do something with it. I want to I want to because Jesus is motivating me in my heart. I want to lead my mind. I want to manage my time. There's some practical truths in there. 
I hope you've got something out of it. The world's waiting for us. Would you stand with me? Father, we just thank you. You're so gracious and so patient with us. Raise your hand if you're thankful for that. Your ever onwards call for us. The sentiment that you love us exactly as we are, but you love us too much to lead you there, I think is embodied today. Lord God, the desire to lead our minds and manage our times, I know it's from you. You did it, Jesus. And you ask us to be with you, to become like you and to do the things that you did. And so in this space, we surrender to you. We surrender to you. Out of honour and respect for for our kids team and indeed for those who this morning has just started to tick over. If you need to go, you need to go. The team's going to lead us in a song and we would love to be able to pray for anybody out here who actually goes, something in me says I need to respond to that message. Time management, mind leadership. There's something I've got to do in there. I need someone to pray with me, lay hands upon me. I want this for my life. I want to be a person of purpose, power. We don't have coffee. I believe we've got ice creams. Why don't you come? Team leaders, if we see you on Thursday night here at 6.30, you'd make my heart so happy. God bless you.